Well, it's great to see everybody. It's a beautiful evening, and uh, the Lord's presence is rich here as well. So we only have just a handful of uh, sessions left together. So after tonight, we only have two more. So our last night will be on June 14th. Uh, in this session, we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. I'm calling this uh, Beasts and Bulls. It sounds like a cereal that didn't quite make it or something. I don't know. But um, in this session, we are picking up uh, things at chapter 13. And we're looking, we've come up to the point now where we're looking at John's vision of these two beasts and the reign of the Antichrist. And then we will see the bowls of wrath being poured out, which concludes God's wrath, as you know by now. So I'm going to begin reading in chapter 13 of Revelation, verse 1. John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this again, I think you can tell, is another one of these cutaway scenes as we've been referring to them. And in this cutaway scene, John is standing on the shore of the sea. Uh, remember that in Jewish thinking, the sea was a picture of the Gentile nations. Why is that? It's because the sea is always turbulent. It's always churning. It's never at peace or at rest. So the nations are sometimes compared to the sea. Now we can't probably fully understand what this beast represents unless we have some background from the book of Daniel, where Daniel seems to have seen this uh, same beast, beast with ten horns. John doesn't explain the beast yet, and that could be uh, perhaps because his readers already understood what it represented. If they were Bible readers, they already had some understanding of this concept from the book of Daniel. But the seven heads of the beast are seven empires that have persecuted the people of God. We're going to find out that the ten horns are ten kings who arise at the end of the age and they give their authority to the Antichrist. This beast has the characteristics of the empires that persecuted God's people, that persecuted the Jewish people from the time of Daniel forward down to uh, the time of John here. So Babylon, Persia, and Greece. Greece moved swiftly like a leopard and was compared to a leopard. Persia was slower and powerful like a bear. Babylon was regal like a lion, and its kings had an absolute level of authority. So the beast is that he's seeing here is really a composite uh, of the characteristics of those empires with, uh, combined with the Antichrist empire. And it's the dragon himself, Satan, who gives the beast his power, meaning his, his strength, his ability, his throne, and his authority. And we read that something amazing happens that causes the world to be amazed at the beast. One of his heads appears to be mortally wounded, but is healed. So, this has had many interpretations. Some people, you might have heard this, some say that the Antichrist will be killed and that he will have a counterfeit resurrection in, in imitation of Jesus, let's say. They say uh, that he will come back to life from a mortal head wound. And while many people have taught that, I'm not sure that I personally agree with that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. First, John says one of the heads of the beast was slain. And those heads more likely represent kingdoms, not a particular individual. John isn't necessarily saying that a particular man will be killed and come back to life. Maybe he's saying that, but I don't think we should say that for 100%. Second, John says that he saw this head 
as if it had been mortally wounded. So it may only seem to have been killed. And I don't think any of the various Bible translations that you could look at say that the head was actually killed. Third, John says that it was a wound that was healed. Healed means healed. Healed does not mean resurrected. So what I think in the context there and with that language, what I think God is saying is that one of those evil empires of the past is going to return in some form. And the world will be amazed and follow the beast proclaiming that no one can defeat it in battle. And again, a caution again, and I, I think we've said this a few times, but when it says the whole world, we're not sure if that really means the entire planet at this point, because it could just be a reference to the part of the world that they were familiar with. It could just be the Middle East, right? Um, you might say, well, doesn't that contradict the word? Well, not necessarily. Remember, um, writers can use, it could be hyperbole, or it could just be a designation for the part of the world that they were familiar with. We have this in the Christmas story. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That doesn't mean all the world was taxed. It doesn't mean that Caesar was taxing the Japanese and the Aztecs, right? It means the whole Mediterranean world that was under discussion. So we can't really be 100% sure. I wouldn't want to be dogmatic about that. Verse 5, it says, he, we're talking about the beast again, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the beast has authority to continue for 42 months. And again, uh, as I think you know by now, that is the same time frame that we have seen numerous times, three and a half years. Notice that he has power to overcome the saints in his persecutions. And notice also that he is characterized by his blasphemies. So sometimes I think people have... The idea that the Antichrist is going to pretend to be God, that he's going to pretend to be Jesus or something like that, that is not the case. He blasphemes God. He blasphemes Christ. When it says that he, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians how he sits in the temple showing that he is God, it doesn't mean that he's impersonating the God that we worship. It means that he's saying, I'm God. <laughs> He is opposed to the God of Israel, and he's blaspheming the God of Israel. So we can see that back in Daniel, where it tells us that he speaks against the God of God. So just uh, something to, to take note of in our reading there. So um, we know from Daniel that there are places, there are nations that do rebel against him. There are places that slip out of his grasp. But in this section, the language notice is stronger, and it does seem to indicate from the strength of the language that at least for a time, the Antichrist does have power over every government. So can't be sure. Maybe it's in the process of his conquest that he gradually extends his reign over virtually the entire world. Uh, we, it's just hard to know. But John says that this calls for patience. He says, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So it is a situation that will call for patience and steadfastness because uh, contrary to what you might see in Christian movies sometimes, some of which are truly ridiculous, uh, resistance to a regime like this is really not going to be much of an option. Um, we, know, um, we know how difficult it is, right? Especially if you're unarmed and especially if you're dealing with someone 
who is going to have the level of, of technology right, that will be existing uh, for surveillance and coupled with the fact that there is also supernatural, demonic, uh, satanic, I should say, uh, empowerment of this system. So John says, look, this is the thing that is just going to call for patience and faith on the part of people. Resistance is not going to be much of an option. Verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So most commentators um, connect this second beast with the idea of what we call the false prophet, the person known as the false prophet. And there's a distinction here. We notice that he comes from the land. Now what that means, I don't think we can say. Does he come from the Antichrist's kingdom? Does he come from perhaps Israel? Uh, we just have very little detail here. This is about all the detail we ever get in the scripture about his background or his activity. Uh, we do know that Satan empowers both the Antichrist and the false prophet. We saw <clears throat> how the dragon stood on the seashore and perhaps... That's John's way of emphasizing to us that the dragon has dominion over both the sea and the land during this period. And clearly from the text, the false prophet can perform demonic miracles. Jesus warned us in the Gospels, if you recall, that false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But you know, we can't be sure yet um, whether this power to give breath to the image of the beast, is it something demonic or is it something technological? Is it an AI, right? Everybody the last few weeks has been all fired up uh, about artificial intelligence. Does that come into play? Is it demonic or is it both demonic and tech? Uh, time will tell. He has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. That is a brilliant description, right? I think this tells us that he's going to come probably with a very mild appearance, a very mild manner of speech, very soothing, very persuasive, imitating the gentleness of Jesus Christ. He will appear to people very lamb-like. However, according to John, his words are dragon words, and it's so important for us as Christians, right, not to be taken in by people who come to us in a very lamb-like way, in a very lamb-like manner, and how they treat you and so forth. But you listen to what they say. Listen to their speech and what they have to say about God and his work and what they have to say about Jesus. These words that he will speak are antichrist words. They are words that deny the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will deny his person and his godhood. The spirit of antichrist denies the cross of Jesus. It denies that he's the son of God and denies that he is God the son. So you have to listen. No matter how, you know, suave and charming and telegenic and how good they are on TV and all this sort of thing. You have to listen to what they say. Verse 16, very familiar passage, of course. Um, even people in the world, of course, know uh, some of what's in this passage. It says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. 
Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. And by the way, that word calculate means exactly what you think it means. In the Greek, it means you're doing math. Because it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So you can see here that the enemy of our souls, he seeks total economic control. He knows that out of fear, out of desperation, people will sell themselves to stay alive. No one um, under the dominion of the Antichrist will be able to engage in any commerce at all without this mark. This is one reason, right, why privacy advocates at the moment are very concerned, whether they're Christian or whether they're not Christian at all. They are very concerned about this move of, of different governments um, moving towards a completely digital currency, that everything will be digital, um, because while that may be convenient on some levels, it also allows total control total knowledge, you know, that you that you bought a tin of Altoids yesterday, you know, for $2.99, you know, at the wheels sit go down in the corner, like they will know. And that's very concerning. At least it is to some of us. But the mark of the beast is not just a technological convenience, nor is it just a means of control. It is a sign of a person's allegiance to the beast. Without it, you won't, you won't uh, simply be impoverished, but you'll also be an outcast and probably a hunted fugitive as well because you would not be willing to offer your allegiance and offer your worship to this person. Now, notice what the Bible says, that it is the false prophet who causes people to receive the mark. It is not your favorite rich technocratic billionaire, nor is it the United Nations. It is not some health organization or any other world organization. So whatever comes down the road at you, although it... Listen, I, I want to tell you something. You can have tyranny, and yet it's not the mark of the beast. You understand that, right? I mean, there were horrible things, World War II, there were horrible things uh, nearer in time to us, different kinds of tyranny, communist tyranny and so forth. It was not the mark of the beast, and it was still awful. So um, what am I getting at? Nothing that comes along before the false prophet is the mark of the beast. That doesn't mean that I think it's good, Right? If they take our money away and make us use electronic money or whatever. I'm not saying that that would be good. I'm just saying it's not the mark of the beast until it is connected to the worship of the beast and giving allegiance to him. Because what is it? It's not just a barcode. It is a mark or name of the beast. So it has to be connected to that person. Or the number of his name. It has to be connected somehow to him and the devil's desire to cause people to worship him. Does that, does that make sense? So don't, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean that I agree with any evil scheme that somebody might be doing out there. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, okay, fight evil, fight tyranny. But until this happens, it's not the mark of the beast. So Please stop sending your pastor's TikTok videos saying that the beast's mark is here. Because it's not, okay? So you would think that the scriptures here would stop people from making conspiracy videos, but it does not. All right. I do believe that the mark uh, involves physical alteration of the body. There's a Greek word here for mark, and you can look it up in your... Bible Dictionary or Concordance is haragma. It means a mark like the mark that you would get or make from scratching or stamping something. So there is a physicality uh, to this word. So it could be a tattoo. It could be something else imprinted in your flesh. Uh, I don't think we know yet. But I, I, think it will, I don't think it will be something subtle because people will be proud to wear this. 
especially if they are hardcore devoted worshipers of this miracle working man. They're going to be very proud to show you what's wrong with you, man. You don't have, you don't have his mark yet. Don't you love him? He's awesome. How could you not take his mark? What are you? Are you one of those, you know, you know, yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's very knowing and conscious, conscious, because that rebellion of the, of the last days is not just rebellion in general. It may be rebellion in general now, but not at the end of the age. If you read Psalm 2, King David understood this 3,000 years ago, that at the end of the age, it's going to be very conscious whom that rebellion is directed against. The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and his anointed, his Mashiach, his Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords away from us. It will be a knowing and deliberate rejection and blaspheming of the God of Israel and Jesus, his son. See, what you, you understand the difference? What we have now in society, for the most part, people are not doing it to stick a finger in God's eye. But at the end of the age, the lines are drawn. And it's going to be a very different matter. And they will be proud to wear that mark. All right, so let's talk about this famous number 666. It could stand as has been suggested, for man making himself God. Uh, as we've talked about uh, biblical numerology a little bit here in this course, six is the number of man. I think you know that. And when we triple that, we make a kind of trinity. So it could, the number could speak, and it speaks to me certainly, of, of man substituting himself for God. Why does John call it the number of a man? Well, in the ancient world... And even all the way up to the present time, in many different religious and mystical systems, people try to find spiritual meaning in words and names through the practice of what is called gematria. So in gematria, people assign number values to different letters of the alphabet. And then people study the results. They add them up and so forth and try to discern something about a name or a word based on what the numbers add up to, right? So let's say we were doing this in English, A is one, B is two, C is three, and so forth. But it had more meaning in some ancient languages because in a language like Hebrew, um, letters were and still are used for numbers. So Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet, is not just the letter A to the Hebrews. It actually can be the number one and so forth. And so people will add up the number value of words and names to try to uh, come up with a meaning. And so the idea here has always been that whoever this person is, that his name will add up to 666 perhaps. And so um, I think you can imagine, because we know how people are, that um, people have had all kinds of candidates, all kinds of possible candidates for the Antichrist. But biblically, uh, and you might have heard me talk about this in one of our Q&A times, but biblically, John using the 666 would have reminded Bible readers of another person, and that is King Solomon. Because we do see the number 666 in the story of King Solomon. And it's, it's very notable that Solomon, uh, through all of his trade and his taxation and so forth, the amount of gold that came to him in a year was 666 talents of gold. That's a lot of gold because a talent would run between 80 and 120 pounds. So the amount of gold that came to Solomon every year was billions of dollars. So it's a huge sum. And really, I think it's a way uh, of showing us how, in Solomon's case, um, wealth, lawlessness, and idolatry all went together. Those things all went together in Solomon's life. So is that what John means when he says it's the number of a man? Perhaps. Perhaps the name of the Antichrist actually will be Solomon. 
it is common enough in Hebrew or in Arabic to have your name be Solomon or some derivation of it, or perhaps he will simply resemble Solomon in other ways. But if we study Solomon's life, his career, uh, his apostasy, the wickedness that he went into, the, the defiling of the temple, if you will, not directly, but, you know, Solomon ended up building a house, preparing a house for Molech, literally right across the gate from the gate to the temple of the Lord. That's a long way down to fall from somebody who prayed and had the fire of God fall out of heaven. He went from that to building a house for such an evil God, literally a straight shot out of the gate from God's house. So in many ways, Solomon has been viewed as a type of foreshadowing of the Antichrist. So uh, in the early church, there was discussion about the number as well. So Irenaeus uh, whom we've mentioned, among others, discussed this number. Irenaeus was uh, writing around the year 200. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who had been a disciple of John himself. Uh, we quoted Polycarp in here at one point, I think, talking about his martyrdom. In fact, uh, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. And so Polycarp may actually be mentioned in the book of Revelation because you were with us on our Saturday. You remember how the letters to the churches were written to um, the angels of the churches, the leaders of the churches. And so the angel of the church at Smyrna might actually have been Polycarp at this time. Very interesting. But in any case, with Irenaeus, you have somebody who is a disciple of one of John's disciples. And Irenaeus thought that the 666 was a composite number that pointed to two other forms of wickedness or episodes of wickedness in the past. He said the 600 um, is meant to remind us of the wickedness before the flood because Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. And he said the other part, the 66, he said that makes us think of the idolatrous statue that was made by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had everybody bow down to the statue, kind of an image of the beast foreshadowing. And that famous statue that we read about in Daniel was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide across. So Irenaeus, he thought that 666, therefore, it summed up all the evil of wickedness and all the evil of idolatry. But he said, you know, I don't want to try to use the number to figure out the name of the Antichrist. But he, he thought that when the Antichrist did appear, that the believers would then be able to use that number to identify him. So Irenaeus would have been against us, you know, writing books, right? Speculating on who the Antichrist is. Don't waste your time. Um, giving you a quote there from his famous book, which is called Against Heresies. I always think it's, it's amazing to, to read these things by, you know, people that were thinking about this stuff almost 2,000 years ago. It's amazing. We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of Antichrist, for if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him, John, who beheld the apocalyptic vision. For that was seen not very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. But he indicates the number of the name now, so that when this man comes, we may avoid him being aware who he is. So listen, Guys, we would all save ourselves a lot of trouble and we would save a lot of time that we're wasting if we would take this advice and stop speculating about some of these things. Amen? Okay. Two-thirds of you are in agreement with me. Praise God. But this, in any case, uh, whatever it looks like when it comes and whoever the man is when he appears, the idolatry of the last days will have the most serious and immediate consequences as we're about to see in chapter 14 because anyone who receives this mark uh, is destined to be condemned to the lake of fire. So chapter 14, John says, Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, 
before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So this is a mysterious passage to be sure, but it seems that what we have here is we're going to have in chapter 14 some, again, some vignettes, some different scenes showing us the, the spiritual state of people at this time. And what we're seeing here is the 144,000, it would seem, again, it would seem at the completion of their ministry. So it seems that we have telescoped forward in time probably to the time when Jesus returns and they are being shown as uh, the first fruits of the redeemed of Israel. So we probably, what's happening here is we've kind of jumped ahead in time to see their successful uh, perseverance and redemption because you notice that they were not marked. They were marked with God's name. So John is trying, or God is trying to draw for us a great contrast here. So these special Jewish believers are going to be rewarded for their faithfulness with some wonderful privileges. So they have the right to worship God with a special song that apparently only they can learn and play. They also have this wonderful privilege of being allowed to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So think of that. Wherever Jesus goes, these loyal followers will be there with him. You know, you can't just like rush the crowd, right, in the millennium. You know, if you were like a big name rapper and you'd have a posse, right? So when, when Jesus rolls up, he has 144,000, you know, extra holy people with God's name in their forehead who follow him everywhere he goes. And they have a special place of closeness to God's throne. John connects this to the fact that there's no deceit in their mouths. Now, this, as, as I've been saying, um, Revelation is just chock full of these callbacks to the Old Testament. And I believe this is a callback to Psalm 15. See, Jewish people knew that if only if you had clean lips could you stand before God. Remember that Isaiah had to have his lips cleansed when he was taken up, even in vision. He wasn't taken there bodily, right? In Psalm 15, I know you, you've heard this, says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. So that it goes on from there to talk about behavior but the psalm, in other ways, but the psalm begins, and it's a beautiful psalm, please go read it. The psalm begins all about the speech and the, and the speech that flows from, from a pure heart. So beautiful. So in the 144,000, God is showing us the kind of holy living that he is seeking from us. So we have this immediate contrast with chapter 13, and we see a quality of life that is so radically different from the lifestyle of the followers of the beast, right? So they don't have the name of the beast on their forehead, but they have the name of the Father. So that may be invisible to our eyes, but God can see that they are completely devoted to him. They don't blaspheme God like the beast followers do, but they offer him pure worship and a new song. They're not like the followers of the beast who don't have a love for the truth, but it says these men have no deceit in their mouths. Well, what does that have to do with the beast followers? Well, remember, Paul had told us in 2 Thessalonians that God sends them this strong delusion so that they believe a lie. Why? Because they didn't have a love for the truth. Powerful. The followers of the beast reject God and they fall away from his truth. So Paul said the day of Christ was not going to come unless there was first a great falling away. But notice these follow the lamb wherever he goes. What a beautiful description of Christian living that is, amen, to follow Jesus wherever he goes. So they live 
lives of holiness, right? Do you remember we, we talked about the particular sins back in uh, chapter 9, talked about the particular sins that people refuse to repent of during the trumpet judgments. You remember that? There was these six idolatry and fornication and murders and thefts and all that. But these men, it says, refused to defile themselves. So that's why it's great. And we talked about this in one of the Life in the Spirit classes. That's why sometimes it's great, even though it's good to meditate on God's word and just meditate and soak in one little passage. Sometimes you just have to sit down with the book like this, the book of Revelation, and you just have to read through the whole thing in one shot. It might take you an hour and a half to read through the whole thing. But see, if you read through the whole thing in one shot, then you will notice these contrasts. You will notice kind of the, the, the hidden structure of what God is wanting to say to us and make that contrast. Verse 6 it says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. So I, I think this is astounding. From the beginning of creation, as far as I can tell, I don't think that God ever committed the work of preaching to angels. Now, this, these angels are not, uh, this angel is not giving you all the facts of Jesus on the cross and so forth, but, but notice there's an angelic warning, and that's so unusual in the scripture. Preaching is for us to do, but God so eagerly desires people to be saved at this time that he will perhaps suspend his typical way of doing things and he sends an angel through the skies to warn people to fear God. This angel, in reality, is telling people, hey, uh, human beings down there, it's now or never. There may still be a chance even for some of them to repent before the bowls of wrath come. And this angel is warning people that the hour of judgment is upon them. And another angel followed saying, verse 8, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this is the first reference to the concept of, of Babylon. It is hard to define, but in general, I think we can say that Babylon represents worldliness, um, especially with uh, fornication and immorality. It represents worldliness and spiritual fornication. That is a mouthful, but what I mean by that is that it represents committing spiritual adultery against the Lord, spiritual adultery. See, God had told his people in the Old Testament that they had committed adultery against him. We could read about that in Jeremiah. And we will see the same thing at the end of the age. Uh, it will not be popular to be a Christian. Not that it ever has been. But it will be popular to follow false religions and to persecute those who name the name of Jesus. And because of the influence of Babylon, which we'll talk about next week, the nations will have to face the wrath of God. So that's kind of what that strange reference is when he says, drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So her fornication, her spiritual adultery causes wrath. And because of her, in other words, people are going to have to drink the cup of that wrath. That's what he's saying. So what a warning. <laughs> That is, not to be spiritually seduced and not to be drawn away from the truth of God's word. We'll have more to say about that in later chapters. We will, we will dig into Babylon in some depth next week. Uh, going on, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Now look at this warning. Um, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand... He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. In other words, this is not like a, just a warning shot. This is the full strength of God's wrath. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night 
who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here, verse 12, he says again, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That is a frightening warning to hear coming out of the skies from an angel. So again, someone who takes the mark, and here it is called the mark of his name, someone who takes this mark has forfeited their, their salvation, his salvation forever. It will be the equivalent of what Jesus called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because by taking the mark, they will have decided forever to reject the testimony that the Holy Spirit is giving of Jesus. By taking the mark, you are calling the Father and the Holy Spirit liars when they testify about Jesus, who he is and what he has done for us. And it will have eternal consequences. There will be a finality to it. Now listen, there's a super famous preacher out there. Most of you will know his name, one of the most well-known preachers in America. Uh, he has a pretty strong once saved, always saved type of uh, belief. And he says, and he has not retracted it, that you can repent from taking the mark of the beast. That is false. That is a lie. That is completely contrary to God's word. Do not believe that. At the end of the age, many people are going to face this terrible choice. But they will do so either knowing the consequences or not caring. Do you see that? Without excuse. God is so merciful that he will send an angel to warn people of the wrath that will come. People, in other words, are not going to be ignorant of what is at stake. John says that this, this is the patience of the saints. In other words, this situation is going to call for steadfastness on the part of believers. He says, here are those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. In other words, they will not deny their faith. They will not go against the commandments of God by practicing idolatry and worshiping an image or worshiping a man. They will have to endure and stay faithful to Christ even though Antichrist is threatening them with death. So don't believe anybody who says to you that you can repent of this. No, Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Doesn't mean that you're saved by works but it does mean that you're called to endure and not deny Jesus. Jesus said, he that denies me, I will deny him before my Father and the holy angels. And every human being, I think, for the most part, as far as I can tell, when it gets to this point in history, every human being will have to face a challenge like this. The one preacher that says, uh, it will never be easier to serve Jesus than it is right now. And that's true. That's a true word. But Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill you. But then after that, that's all they can do to you. They have nothing more they can do to you after that. Jesus said, I'll tell you who you should fear. Fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. How many of you know that Jesus would not get invited to preach in many places? Verse 13, John says, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, 
Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside of the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So, all right, what did we just see there? Because <laughs> that is awesome, all right? This is, this is a picture, this is picture language showing us uh, that at some point, the harvest of salvation will indeed be over. Jesus compared, you recall, the end of the age to a harvest. He said there are two crops growing up. There are the righteous growing up and there's the unrighteous growing up, the wheat and the tares. Both crops will grow up until the end and be fully mature. The righteous will be wonderfully, beautifully righteous and the wicked will be amazingly, horribly, horrifyingly wicked. Both will be harvested. Here you see a picture of the Son of Man harvesting the wheat, harvesting the good crop. And here you see also the angel harvesting the, the grapes of wrath, in case you ever wonder where that expression uh, came from. So one group is going to be harvested into God's presence. The other will be appointed to wrath and be trampled on. So you have a strong picture here of blood and judgment. This reference to 1,600 furlongs. Furlongs is an old English measurement. It's, it's uh, stadia in the Greek. It's almost 200 miles. So this, uh, I think John is making a symbolic reference here, telling us that there's going to be war and judgment and bloodshed in an area of about 200 miles uh, vicinity of Jerusalem as Jesus destroys the armies of the wicked. So it's, uh, but if you were with us uh, in the things to come class, that will not surprise you. Um, you can go back and watch those videos where we talked about uh, Jesus' military campaign to rescue his people at the end of the age. Chapter 15, I better move more quickly here. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So you got to remember that um, always that there's no chapter breaks in the Bible. <laughs> the chapter breaks were not added and verse numbers were not added until the Middle Ages. So if, if you pretend in your mind like there's some kind of break here, you'll miss the fact that, that this thing of the bowls, these last bowls of God's wrath, comes right on the heels of this judgment, right? So it's, it's all part of the same judgment activity. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, he said, for in them... The wrath of God is complete. And, then, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. In other words, released in the earth. There won't be any issue, right? Sometimes something happens, you're like, oh, I wonder if that was God's judgment. Someday people will not have to wonder about whether something is God's judgment because his judgments will have been manifested in the earth. So here, what are we seeing? God's final outpouring of wrath is about to be released, uh, released and unleashed. And we have this incredible scene in heaven. And it is those who got the victory over the beast, rejoicing in God. So, so what does it mean? They got victory over his image, his mark, and the number of his name. That means that they refused all those things. And they refused the beast himself. In other words, they loved not their lives even unto death. They chose death. They chose martyrdom rather than to submit to that and deny Jesus Christ. And they're singing a song, and we will see more of this um, now from here to the end of Revelation. They are singing a song that justifies 
God. That means that they are proclaiming that God is completely just when he executes the judgments that he is about to send. Now, we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about judgment and all that destruction. But one day, you will be singing in heaven. You might be part of this crowd singing and declaring that God is just to judge them in this way because they will be so supremely wicked. Everything that God does is just and true. Everyone will fear him and honor him. Everyone will worship him. Everyone will see God's holiness as he refuses to tolerate evil any longer on this earth. Verse 5. So here the angels are coming out. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures. Now remember who they are and where they are. They are kind of, we would say in our language, kind of built into the throne, right? They are part of God's throne, and they are bearing up God's throne. So one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were were completed. What was my point in stopping there? My point is this. Notice that these judgments came directly from the throne of God. They come from God himself. They are personal. This is God's personal judgment. And it's one of the living creatures who is at the throne and under the throne. He brings it out from God's presence and gives it to the angel. So um, this judgment is something which only God can do. And the bowls are golden, which speaks of their holiness also. So what are these bowls? If you grew up with the King James, um, you know, in the King James it says vials, like a little, like old time medicine bottle, like your grandma used to have, right? But it's actually a bowl. And these bowls uh, are shallow bowls, the kind that people used to use for washing in these days. So when... People would eat dinner, so they would have their KFC, and they would wash their hands, rinse their hands in these shallow bowls. And, of course, that water is gross, right? So what would they do? they take the bowl, and they just go to the door, and they just fling it outside. So these bowls, symbolically, uh, in the Bible, they are used as a picture of rapid judgment and rapid action on the part of God. It's like, okay... You, you want filth, uh, here's, here's some of the just off-scouring, and here's, here's a bowl of wrath, like, blech, right? And the power and the glory of God is also emphasized here in this section. Nobody can enter, enter the temple while these bowls are being handed to these powerful angels and while the bowls are being poured out. So I think I agree with commentators who say that there is no longer any intercession that can be made at this point. You notice there's no intercession happening here because there's a finality to God's judgment that those who deserve judgment, that's it. There's no more intercession that can be made. The bowls are about to be poured out. Jesus is about to literally come onto the earth and it seems that at least for these people, there's no more possibility of mercy. It's too late. So as we move into chapter 16 and we'll bring it in for a landing here, um, we're going to see the bowls being poured out. So in verse 1, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. So I think John there, he's trying to think of the most disgusting thing that a Jewish person could think of to tell you how bad the sea is going to be. And you'll also notice um, as we go through, I should have mentioned this, but um, as you go through the bowls, you will notice the similarities, the callbacks to the exodus 
right? God bringing his people out of Egypt with plagues just like this. And in many cases, it's the same plagues. And it's the same picture. Because what's happening? God is sending out plagues, judging these false gods who are blaspheming the God of Israel, right? Remember Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh, God of Israel, that I should serve him? Same thing happening here. The deliverer comes. The greater Moses is coming to do what? Redeem his people and bring them into the promised land. So that is, there is a powerful correspondence here. Verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So this level of judgment's hard to imagine, but God's going to strike the natural world and specifically those, I think you can see, who've taken the mark and worshiped the image. But um, you see the result, right? As horrible as these judgments are, the result is not repentance again. The result is more blasphemy. Then, verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So just as a side note, like I'm not a military strategist. I never served in the armed forces. But trying to gather your troops from around the world to fight Jesus Christ, that's a bad military strategy. Okay? <laughs> and then all of a sudden Jesus speaks. There's this voice that says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So Jesus breaks the tension by adding more tension. Uh, in verse 16, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Okay, so real quick, the bowl number five is this unspecified darkness with pain, which again reminds us of the plagues against Egypt. And there's no repentance. The sixth bowl allows the kings of the east to come into the Middle East. So you have these unclean spirits that are sent out, apparently to deceive all the nations into trying to make war against the Lord. The enemy knows that Jesus is going to come and destroy the armies of the wicked, and he says, this is, this is my last shot. Maybe we can, maybe somehow we can win, you know. So where is, is this happening? Um, he gathers them to Armageddon in the north of Israel. Historically, this has been a place of great battles, but we know it's not the only battlefield of Jesus' military campaign. This is only one battle in the final conflict. Uh, it may be the climactic battle. Um, some people do believe that the reference to Armageddon there is actually a reference to Jerusalem. Um, but the Old Testament shows us other places where Jesus is going to make war. That's why, as I've, as I've said a number of times, John doesn't give us details of the war here because the Jewish people already had the details. That there's fighting in Egypt, fighting in Arabia, fighting in Jerusalem, and all over Israel, most likely. Um, you can watch the extensive teaching that we did on this military campaign in the Things to Come class. That's on YouTube. Just remember, Revelation is not written for that purpose. Revelation is to give us perseverance and faith and cause us to see things from God's perspective. It was given to us to encourage us to endure. And Jesus warns the church, I'll say, and the nations that he's coming like a thief. I believe that Jesus is saying this to his own followers 
as well as to the world. Why? Because he's telling people to watch and to keep their garments. That can only be a warning to us, the saints. And then finally, in verse 17, we wrap it up. We have the conclusion of God's wrath. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was so exceedingly great. So this is the end of the wrath of God that comes out of heaven. We don't know, is this something supernatural? Is this something that God orchestrates in the natural using the heavenly bodies or whatever it is? But uh, it seems to be an almost complete destruction of what man has built. The great city was divided. We don't know what that means. Uh, is it Rome? Is it Jerusalem? We don't know. Babylon is also about to suffer its just punishment. Um, you might have you might have heard me say this before, but you know people think um, an eight or a nine earthquake is terrifying. Wait till there's a fourteen, uh, and then you'll say something. But you have this hail that's coming down. I mentioned a talent is about a hundred pounds. So again, if you think you've seen hail, you haven't seen hail. All right. But, it, but once again, there's this consistent theme that we keep seeing tonight that people will blaspheme God rather than serve him. The angels of the water said, you're righteous, O Lord, the one who was and who, who is and who was and who is to be. And um, church, I pray that that will be our confession as well, that we will acknowledge the kingship of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and to do it now. <laughs> while it is relatively easy to do so, and while God's invitation is so loving and gracious. Jesus said in John three seventeen, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we have Jesus' words of warning there. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we'll end it there. I'm sorry that was kind of a long one, but I um, wanted to get that in because we only have a couple of more weeks left to go. But listen, um, pray. <laughs> pray for those you know and care about. Pray for those you don't know and care about yet because they need Jesus. They need Jesus. They need soft hearts that will respond to his gracious gospel invitation before a day comes in which repentance for them is, is not possible because of the hardening uh, of their hearts against God and the choices that, that they've made. And it falls to us as well as believers in Jesus to make sure that our lamps are burning bright, that we don't be found ashamed uh, in, in, the day of, in the day of Christ, but that we endure with him, whatever we're faced. I mean, will we face this? I don't know. This may not happen for hundreds of years. Who knows? But we are always, every day, faced with the choice to be Christ like or not, to respond to his voice or not, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus or not. So that's our choice. So, all right, we'll take some questions and I'm going to grab some water. Back to page 9, where it says the time for intercession is over. Am I to understand, while all this havoc is going on, the saints, those that are righteous and are following the Lord, they are praying in the meantime while this havoc is going on? Um, am I to understand that? Um, and when, it's, when the intercession is over, that's when Jesus just cuts off the prayers and says, that's it, it's done? 
Well, there's, there's certainly, um, that's a good question. I mean, and there's certainly a finality at that point because of once God sets this plan in motion, he, God has his, he says his determination is to shake the nations. So once he begins his, his pattern is, uh, of judgment, he's going to take them to the conclusion. You know, it's like uh, every time you've ever been to a restaurant, at some point, the bill is due, and it's time to pay, right? So at some point, human history will be over, and the one who is in charge of history, the one who has all the times and seasons under his control, will decide that's it. This is the time that now there will be an accounting. And certainly those, I noticed that the bowls are largely directed against destroying the Antichrist kingdom. Now, there may not be a lot of people, from what we read, that survive this in the body. I mean, I think whether you're pre-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, whatever you are, by this point, believers are in a resurrection body. But there will not be many people, I don't think, who will survive in this natural body into the millennium. Now, as Jesus comes back, um, and the millennium begins, you know, it's party and celebration time, and people from the Gentile nations are rejoicing with the Jewish people, bringing them back to Israel, the survivors, and so forth. There's beautiful scenes representing that in the scriptures in Isaiah. It's, it's, really, quite, it's really quite wonderful. But for those who've taken the mark, for those who've defied God, there is a limit. There is a cutoff date, and at, at that point, God's like, no. There's no more that, that can be done for them. They have, their fate is sealed and they've made their choices and God has given them all those trumpets. They curse God through the trumpets instead of repenting and through the bowls, there's no repentance either. So what can one say? I, you know, <laughs> so, but um, it's, it's an awesome scene. I wish we had weeks to go through each verse. Me too. Um, Pastor Nick, um, at the time when uh, those uh, who refuse to worship the beast and they make that choice, I, I mean, does does the beast allow them to live on, or are they immediately cut down, or or some cut down immediately, or some get a chance to maybe to change their mind? Or... Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's. Um, quite a mixed bag, if you will, if I could say it that way, because you do have a large group of martyrs. Um, you have large groups of people that you see in heaven rejoicing, um, but you also have some survivors. And you also have people, of course, who are dying from all the other various things that we've seen. You know, if God lifts off his hand of restraint, the seals are open and all these big and powerful nations of the world start lobbing bombs at each other, the world's going to be a very, very bad place, even without the mark of the beast, right? I mean, we saw at the outset of the seals, there's war, there's famine, there's plague, and, and that's all before this really gets, gets rolling. So um, it may be that there will be people who hide out, who are able to scratch out in existence you know, in hiding, but they will, they will definitely be fugitives. Um, we saw in Revelation 12, certainly for that Jewish believing remnant, they're preserved and protected by God, and God is, is helping them. There are some other nations nearby that apparently resent the Antichrist. So Daniel tells us that some of those cousin nations, you know, Edom and Moab and so forth, they're kind of helping the Jews, and, and they slip out of the Antichrist's fingers. So... Um, I think it's going to be a very broad and varied, uh, a, a very um, a varied picture, right? With a lot of different possibilities and outcomes. So, um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I have a question on um, in chapter fourteen. You uh, covers the harvest. But then following that, so I assume that all the har I mean, it would sound like all the harvest is done and the wrath has happened.
But then the following chapters continue to talk, but the people are still there. So any comment on that? Yeah, I think, I think the reason why they made a chapter break between 14 and 15 is because 14 is a visionary experience, right, where he's just seeing this is the big picture, that there's coming this moment when Christ is going to gather the wheat into his barn, but then there's this other harvest of grapes that are about to be squished. And so that's kind of one vision and then what comes after that is you're seeing how that plays out in in the natural right because it's a very uh i can't find the after so much talking i can't find the right word i was going to say fanciful but that's not the right word it's it's this it's it is kind of a fanciful representation of of christ you know seated on a cloud reaping it's it's very different from the pictures we've seen of, of God enthroned and so forth and the sea of glass and the throne room and the four living creatures. So it's, I think it's just a pure visionary um, experience using that motif of the harvest to explain what is then broken out. Because once that word happens, then the next thing is, okay, here's what's happening now on the earth all these horrible bowls of wrath are being are being poured out. So yeah, that's but that's very good. Hello, sir. Good evening. Uh, this is a reference to um, chapter thirteen, verse eleven. It says here, another beast. One one came and hit his time, and then another beast came out. Okay, is this a warning that evil empires? will come and go, but they will be, there will be other ones emerge. This is going to go on, this resurgence of one evil empire and then another until the very end. Yeah, that is a, that's actually a fabulous question. You were definitely in the running for the gold star tonight. So, um, because if you take it back to where the, all this vision um, where, where this, this template or this motif of beasts began, it began in Daniel 7, in that Daniel 7 vision when he sees the Son of Man being presented to the Father in heaven, if you remember that, and then a kingdom and authority and so forth. And what you're seeing is the beast and all of these other beasts that he saw, that Daniel saw, and they were all, at the end, they were consigned to the flames. So Daniel... And John, Daniel is really telling us that these beasts are going to continue to harass the people of God all the way to the end of the age, all the way to the end of the age. And he's saying, Here, here's what calls for the patience of the saints, right? Because Jesus actually overcame the same way by not preserving his life. And he was slain right, by the wicked human powers and the wicked spiritual powers. Interesting. And at the end of the age, you have a great many people who will be called upon to suffer like him in the same way, you know, recognizing that they are appointed to that and yet showing the victory and having the victory not by shooting them or, you know, killing the beast followers, but by not loving their lives to the death, right? It's the same scenario as, you know, well, king, know this, our God whom we serve, he is well able to rescue us out of your hand. But if not, O oh king, we will still not bow down to you. It's going to be the same thing except perhaps on a planetary scale. So see, we, we imitate Christ in that. We, we're, we suffer like him. This is why it, it says, right, in the New Testament, like if, if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. So Jesus suffering, being slain by beasts, and then rising and being glorified, we are living out that same thing as a pattern. We suffer. We may perhaps be martyred, and we will, if we do that and not deny him, we will also be glorified and reign with him. So you're exactly right. 
uh, that is exactly the point uh, in Daniel 7 to encourage the people that this is only for a time and your job, if you find yourself living in this situation, is to be patient and know that at the end of it, the Son of Man is coming and those beasts will be destroyed and then the kingdom will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's what Daniel says. So go back and read Daniel 7 if, I, if I've lost you there. But it's a tremendous picture. And when Paul's writing the letters and Peter talking about suffering and so forth, they're really reaching back into Daniel 7 to make those points. It, it, it really is uh, quite a powerful connection. So I know, whew, I think I needed some protein. Yeah. Correct me through this if I don't get this right. Um, you mentioned, or we read, um, about the 144,000 men. Um, it kind of put me in a place of thinking when Jesus was born, his life was already, you know, on the line with Herod and stuff, and how all the, the firstborn males were taken. I kind of, like, connected those 144,000, even though there may not have been that many surrounding Herod at the time, but I, I feel like those children that were taken have a special place in heaven right now with God. Well, uh, perhaps I mean we don't we don't have any indication, and they don't uh, they don't um, appear anywhere else in Scripture. But um, you know the fact that they are. Uh, the subject of a prophecy and the fact that really their lives were, were taken um, in, a, in a persecution that, that was directed at Jesus Christ, you know, does, does lead me to think that they're, uh, that, you know, that, I mean, we will know who they are, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, in the age to come, and it, they will probably have some kind of, of place of honor Right. Mm hmm Yep. So, no, that's 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 interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought of that. Anybody else? Hello, friends. Um, this is a question that refers to chapter fourteen, verse six. It talks about the angel who comes and warns everybody to fear God and give Him glory. So. I know that God desires all men to be saved and that he sent this angel to maybe appeal to those people who might turn. Do you think that there were a good number of people who did or, I mean, we don't know, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think we can, I don't think we can say yet. I mean, I think there are a lot of martyrs um, and the situation certainly um, at the rapture, let's say, if if it's well, let me, let me let me walk that back. Let me see how. Um, the situation becomes so dire that Jesus said, unless those days were cut short, no flesh would be saved. So it's. Um, so catastrophic in terms of probably not just the, the persecution, but probably just, as I said a few moments ago, everything else that's happening, right, in terms of war, destruction, um, you know, I, I, I really don't think that we've made all these weapons and, you know, not to use them someday. <laughs> so... It's, it's only the mercy of God and, and the restraint of God that, you know, has, you know, that we haven't had like a world war, right, since 1945. But apparently, from what I read in the scripture, um, you know, I don't think that will always be the case. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know when, when the millennium starts, how many people will be left Compared to we have eight billion people right now, I mean, 
will, will the population, the natural population be reduced by 90%, 75%, 95%? I mean, we, ju we just don't know. We just know based on Jesus' own words that it's going to be horrific. So it's going to be a lot more people than made it through the flood. That was, took the whole human race down to eight people. It's not going to be like that, but it will be really bad yeah. for sure. Yeah, my two questions are uh, water-related. Um, the first one is the angel is going to strike the sea, and all the fish are going to die in it. The first, so my first question is, does that the sea mean all the bodies of oceans which are connected, which cover most of the earth? And the second one is, uh, I saw... Um, Maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but I saw two YouTube videos <laughs> which say that um, the Euphrates River in many places, and they showed it, are, are bone dry, okay? And, um, uh, but it also says that the angel will dry up the whole Euphrates River. So um, is there any significance with it being parts of it being bone dry according, and they're tying it into the scripture, why it's drying now. I was wondering if anybody was gonna ask me that. <laughs> Seriously. Um, about the waters, like, I don't know that we can say for sure, is that a, is that a worldwide event? Uh, I, I just don't know. Um, something like that was happening earlier you know, with the trumpets and all against the waters. And we don't know, is that a worldwide thing? Is it only directed against the kingdom of the Antichrist? Or, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, if it's a worldwide thing, then it has to correct itself soon because, you know, you could only live a few days, right, without some kind of a source of water. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's certainly designed to, as I said, make us think. It's a, it's a callback, as we would say, to God delivering his people out of Egypt. And in fact, God, in the person of Jesus, will indeed be delivering his people again out of Egypt, also drying up the water there again and delivering them out of all these places where they will have been taken captive by then. Um, as far as the Euphrates, um, you know, I've had people send me videos about that. That, that is a phenomenon that has been going on, uh, that's been happening for 10 or so years. Um, I don't, you know, and people are like, oh, that's, that's the, that means that we're at the time, you know, that we're at the time of the, of the sixth, you know, bowl already. I'm like, uh, no. Uh, because I think if we were in the sixth bowl, and I'm, no, I'm not picking on you who's saying that, but I'm just saying, look, um, if you're at the sixth bowl, then all of these other things have already happened, right? So um, I think, uh, you know, those things go back and forth, you know, maybe with, uh, with the cycles and so forth. And some of that is actually because of the dams, if I'm not mistaken, and so forth, and these different countries are sometimes ready to come to blows um, because of water access and everything. I, I think that event is something that will be supernatural, supernaturally be done um, to, to enable this mass movement of people. Because God's determination is that he's going to, if you read the book of Joel, he's going to bring all the nations down there. So all the rebellious nations are going to be brought into that area according to the book of Joel. So if, if that means that he's got to drag everybody over there from Europe, Africa, Asia, whatever, to come down because they're trying to... It's interesting, we're getting ahead of it, but in chapter 19, it says that those nations, they were all gathered together to make war against the one who sat on the horse. Like, really, guys? What, what do you think a bullet is going to stop the person that made the universe by speaking it? So, but, but that is the level of demonic insanity, right, that will be in play at that time, that people literally think they can defeat God. But, but it's also God who's doing it because 
God is drawing them there. Um, the devil is drawing them there, but God is drawing them there as well for the purpose of judgment. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a fascinating uh, dynamic. So we have, we have friends in other countries that want to hear the question. Earlier when you said that people would just sit back and contemplate, you know, uh, could that be the Antichrist? Or could that guy be the Antichrist? In the 80s, I would look around and think about it and... Then Ronald Reagan came into office, and guess what? Six, six, six. I says, gotta be. This guy is an actor. What the hell is he doing being the president? But it wasn't him, of course. But I, you know, I was thinking on the same lines. After that, I stopped. I says, Lord, this is not my job. When it happens, it'll happen, you know? But it's funny how everyone just gets on that, like as if we're all the gods. You know, it's like, give it up. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> well, I don't know if we could sit back and enjoy the ride, but... Uh... <laughs> But I, under, I understand. No, I remember people were saying, listen, people are saying Reagan was the Antichrist. I remember when um, President Sadat of Egypt got assassinated 40 plus years ago and people were expecting him to rise from the dead the next day and be the Antichrist. And, and you know, people said Obama's the Antichrist. There's people that said Trump is the Antichrist. There's people that say Trump is the son of man and the son of God now. I don't know if you've seen this thing on like a billboard saying Trump is the son of man. But, you know, I mean, look, I mean, people, and it's kind of sad because people have been doing this almost since John wrote the book of Revelation. They said it's Nero, that Nero is going to come back out of the abyss and be the Antichrist. So there's people that really believe that. Or they believe that Judas is coming back. Some people have believed that Hitler is going to come back out of the abyss. And so, so you know, um, but to your point, we absolutely should not spend um, any inordinate amount of time trying to figure out who this person was. So, so if a guy who was a disciple of John's disciple said that it was a waste of time to do that, I'm going to agree with Irenaeus and Polycarp and whoever and say, okay, if they thought it was a waste of time, and they knew John or they knew John's disciples, then I'm not going to go make, you know, TikTok videos claiming that, you know, Obama's the Antichrist or whatever. So, No, I know, but it's like we, we you know, but Christians, uh, well, I, I guess what I want to say is that people just, people just can't help themselves. You know, so whether it's immaturity, whether it's because, to be honest, they want to make a buck, you know, that they're going to make videos and movies and sell books and whatever, but we're not going to know, and we're not going to know what the mark of the beast is, and we're not going to know who's compelling people to take the mark until, until it's time. So, so, well, thank you, everybody. We will see you next week. Next week, we're, we're going from Babylon to Armageddon, so... It's like a it's like a tour going bad, right? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of it's, it's kind of yeah, down and to the right. So. Bless you, everybody.